Hello and welcome to this awesome panel. Netflix has assembled to talk all things Lock and Key Season 2, which is coming to Netflix on October 22nd. Joining me today are executive producers Carlton Cuse, Meredith Averill, and Gabriel Rodriguez. And we have three of the Lock family members. We have Darby Stanchfield as Nina, Connor Jessup as Tyler, and Amelia Jones as Kinsey Locke. Thank you all for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And just to let you know, later in the show, the producers are going to stick around so we can answer some more questions, but we're also going to be joined by the season two villains. That's Griffin Gluck as Gabe and Halia Jones as Eden. So make sure to stick around for that. But I want to get just get right into it. Um, for the producers, uh, I'd love to know, what can you tell us about season two? What can we expect in Lock and Key season two? Um, I think in season two, we just took the volume and turned it up to 11. I mean, we just tried to make everything bigger, more dramatic, more exciting. We, you know, we really got to know the characters in the show in the first season. And I think Meredith and I really tried to sort of take that knowledge and really just amp up the storytelling in the second season. There were some wonderful uh, set pieces in, in season one. I mean, the one that comes to mind, of course, in, in my head is the, the scene with the shadows in the finale, just awesome. Um, I, I was wondering if you can speak to, will we see more uh, exciting uh, set pieces like that in season two? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because we're dialing it all up, it's just so much more intense. If you've seen the trailer, then you know that there is a, a sequence with a spider that uh, Mr. Connor Jessup can speak to is how very <laughs> scary that is. Uh, and it's something that Gabriel Rodriguez knows a lot about because it actually comes directly from the comic. Um, but we have just so many intense action packed sequences that we can't wait for everyone to see. And uh, uh, Gabriel, I have a question for you. I have my, you know, some of my books here, uh, Lock and Key uh, graphic novels here. Uh, I got these at, at Comic-Con um, in 2014. This is one of the Comic-Con editions right here. I was wondering, Ooh. is there anything from the um, books that, uh, that you wanted to, uh, that you were excited to see that you could change or maybe add on to in the Netflix story that you didn't get to do in the books? I think one of the great things about the Netflix show is that these guys, this creative family that has tackled the Lock and Key series, they are so inventive and so creative and so driven by their passion for the story and characters that they have found ways to take these characters and this mythology and turn it into completely new directions in the show. So one of the things that's refreshing and exciting for me as a viewer of the show is that even I, that I'm one of the creators of a graphic novel, I'm constantly surprised for the spin they gave to the concept, to the characters and the locations of the story. So yeah, I think uh, people that love the comics and the graphic novels are going to realize that there are lots of elements of the books in the show, but they are all come to life in new ways. And that's one of the most exciting things of it for me. Really cool. Um, and I want to move to the, the Locke family. Um, Connor, Amelia, and, and, and Darby. Um, I'm just curious to learn more about what the Locke family dynamic is like in season two. It seems like at the end of season one, after those just crazy events in the finale, you, you guys were closer than ever. Um, seems like this is gonna be, I mean, even though there's a lot of crazy things that are, I'm guessing are gonna happen in season two, it seemed like your family unit uh, was really strong. And uh, Darby, as the uh, matriarch, I'd love to start with you. Uh, it changes again in season two, uh, the dynamic of the Locke family, something that I um, can speak to that the whole family experiences, especially uh, myself and um, Kinsey and Tyler, Connor and Amelia, are um, love and loss, like experiencing it again after Rendell's death. There is um, more, um, there's more of a theme of that, that they each go through personally. Um, and some of that they experience together and some of it is very isolating. And um, that was really interesting to shoot during a pandemic when we were all very isolated. These moments of isolation that come up for all of us, whether you know it's one of the lock kids and they're in their own trouble and, they're, and they can't talk about it because of, that's the way they deal with it. Or Nina, because she can't see the magic. I mean, there's different you know, sort of forms of isolation. So it's, it's, a, it's a rocky, uh, crazy, uh, you know, um, time for the family. And, and to, uh, to speak of what Carlton said, it's dialed up to 11. So on top of the family drama, there's just, it's like, 
it's like Marvel. There's just like action and, and special effects that are beyond. It's just really um, stunning. And uh, Connor and Amelia, can, can you speak to uh, your characters in season two? I mean, I think a lot happens over the course of season two. Yeah, at the beginning, I think we're all having fun with the keys, which is quite nice. I think we all at the beginning, when we started shooting season two, it was for the first couple episodes, there was this feeling of like, what's going on? Like, is something different? Is something, uh, what's what's different than last year? And we realized that it was because we were all liked each other <laughs> in the show. Yeah. Like, everyone's getting along. Yeah. Tyler and Kinsey aren't fighting. We have scenes where we're just having, we're enjoying each other's company. We're enjoying the keys too. We're like you, like you said, like you find the lock, at the end of season one, the locks feel like they've won and they've worked through some of the emotional mm -hmm. baggage that they were carrying. Uh, each in their own ways. So you find them at the beginning of season two doing pretty well mm -hmm. uh, individually and with each other, mm -hmm. um, which was new for us and fun. Yeah, it was really fun to play. It changes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know, over the <laughs> course of the show, the locks are also kind of figuring out what it means to be the new keepers of the keys. Yeah. We'll go back to the uh, producers, uh, Carlton or Meredith or, or, or Gabe, if you can speak to um, the, the, some of the new keys that we're going to see. I mean, obviously the keys are, are awesome. Again, going back to my time at Comic-Con, I remember going to the IDW booth and they had keys you could buy, replicas, of course, but I remember I, I bought a few of them just because I just love looking at them. And I was wondering if you could, are there any keys you can uh, hint at or, or tell us uh, what we're going to see in season two? Yeah, this season we have, if you've seen the trailer, you've seen that they're, the Small World key is a part of this new season. Uh, you see a brand new key that Gabe has created, uh, Gabe the character, not Gabriel Rodriguez, who's here with us. Uh, uh, we don't want to, we're not going to spoil what that key is, but if you've seen it, you can probably imagine that it looks like it's not a key that does good things. But it was fun coming up with brand new keys, but also introducing keys from the comic um, and Gabriel actually uh, designed one of our one of the new keys that we're not going to spoil here, but that you'll see in in yes. the season. Uh, I was wondering, um, Connor, I wanted to uh, jump back to you. Um, there's a I'm not sure how much you can say, of course, uh, without giving away too many spoilers. But in, in the comic books, there's this thing called the rifle rule, which is like you're worried of, as you get older. You know, you're worried about losing your uh, ability to remember magic, you know, kind of, yeah. um, you know, and that whole thing. So I was wondering, um, is that a, a threat in season two? Does that come up at all? I'm just curious. I know that you're getting older, you're approaching the 18, you know, you're getting, getting ready to graduate high school. Yeah, it's shocking, right? I know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, you know, in season one, when we meet Tyler, he's already 17. Mm -hmm. um, so looming over him, I mean, it, when they start playing with the keys they don't know about this rule but they learn pretty quickly because of nina and because of other adults in their lives that there's something about the magic of these keys doesn't stick to adults it they can see them in the moment but then it slides off and he realizes quickly at the beginning of season two him and jackie that they're both on the precipice of becoming adults and they don't know exactly what that means or exactly how it will work or how it will happen but he knows that it means they're going to forget. And if they forget magic, if they forget the keys, they forget everything that goes along with it. All the, the emotional, all the catharsis that comes mm -hmm. along with it, all the fun, all the memories they have. Um, and he becomes very, very uh, set on finding a way to prevent that from happening for him and for Jackie and for Kinsey and Bodie and for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big part of, of his journey in season two. And uh, uh, Gabriel, I want to go to you. I know you, I, I rewatched the season one finale again, just to refresh my memory. And I think I missed this the first time I watched it, but you and Joe Hill, of course, mm -hmm. you, you created this this great, um, awesome, amazing story that the, the series is based on, having a cool cameo in the season one finale as the paramedics. Um, should fans be looking out for you in season two, if you can reveal that? Should we keep our eyes open? <laughs> Well, I, I can't reveal anything about it right now because I know Carlton is working on a series of spin off <laughs> of Lock and Key. It's going to be amazing. We don't want to announce it yet because the two hottest EMTs yeah. of Madison, Massachusetts, are becoming. This, this is actually this is the launch of the Emmy campaign. Oh. 
Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to tease anything about that, but what I'm going to say is that uh, the COVID crisis uh, certainly saved the, uh, the show for Netflix. So I guess we're, we're going to find another ways to be around the, the, the show in the upcoming seasons. And so far, I think it's in pretty good, good hands with the production and creative crew of the, of the Logiki show. Yeah. It was great to be there. I guess we were put in, in that last scene just to see if the series survived our Camille. So <laughs> the job that all these guys did was so good that even survived us. And that's a, a huge statement on the quality of the show. Plus, after you trashed your trailers, I'm not sure we would have you back. <laughs> the I hotel mean, damages yeah. alone. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a very special reason of why there's a character named Joe in the show and another named Gabe in the show, and we both know how they are. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a wow. hint. That's <laughs> cool. It's really cool. Um, I, there's not here right now, but I, I couldn't uh, leave without uh, asking in on, on Jackson. I mean, his endearing portrayal of, of Bodhi was one of the many highlights of season one. He just... I think it just brought out that inner kid and in, in me. I know I, I just loved watching him. He was just dynamic uh, on screen. And I just want to know, uh, uh, Carlton or Meredith, if you give us a little uh, uh, update uh, on Bodhi's character and, and what he's going to be up to in season two. Is going to be getting into more mischief and uh, discovering more keys. Yeah, absolutely. We get to see a lot more from Jackson this season, and he's really matured. Um, and you know, he gives a really emotional performance. He gets to go to places he didn't. Get to go in season one so i think you're really going to see much more depth from him this season and he's just terrific so fun and, and for the lock family so i was just curious about the the house um of course i'm watching this and i think i have my inside information and i think like oh it's just a set somewhere it's got to be but the house feels so lived in uh the key house it just looks it feels like it came straight off the pages of the book i just love looking what's it like to just be in the house and I mean, do you get that sense as well when you're filming? I was just curious if you could talk about the design of it and, and, and the set a little bit. I was just curious about the, the creation of it. Go for it. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the set was designed by uh, Roy Shane, who's a wonderful production designer. And it's it's very practically laid out. So when you're in it, you know, it's not like, it, that you feel very much like you're in the house. And I think mm -hmm. that that's an important part of, um, mm -hmm. The, the, the kind of the characters that you, that you can move around from room to room without sort of um, uh, kind of breaking the fourth wall and realizing yeah. you're on a set. Yeah. But you guys but spend so much the time same there. Time, at the same time, Key House is gigantic. So it takes up two different stages, maybe three, yeah. and an exterior. So our, our relationship to the space is, it's, it's massive. Um, so you know, you, uh, you know, the work is done for us. We don't have to really pretend the enormity of it or the power of it. It's just already built for us. Um, mm -hmm. And the patina was all there from season one and, um, you know, the wear from, from the many years and the detail. There are okay. KH for key house, like carved everywhere. There are little keys in the tiles. There are details. There's a stained glass window. There's a little a man falling out of the boat, a really dark little detail that no one will ever see, but that's like, there are hundreds of them everywhere. It's the most incredible set. And also because we shot seasons two and three uh, back to back, we were able to uh, plant things that don't even, come, don't even become yeah. part of the show until season three yeah. in season two. So when you're yeah. watching season two yeah. in the background unnoticed will be things Easter that become, yeah. become very important yes. later in the show. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. That's really cool. Um, I, I just want to thank you for uh, answering all of my questions. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, can't wait to watch all of season two on October 22nd. Um, Darby, Connor, and Amelia, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, David. The producers are going to stick of course. Yeah, of course. No. Uh, producers are going to stick around and hang out with me a little longer. And uh, we're going to welcome in uh, Griffin Gluck and Halia Jones uh, to talk to the villains. Mm. Bye, Bye guys. Bye, Amelia. So Bye. Great Bye. To see you guys. Bye. Thank you. And joining us for our second round of interviews, we still have the producers on deck with us. And then also joining us is Griffin Gluck as Gabe and Halia Jones as Eden, the season two villains. Halia, I kind of want to start with you. Again, I don't know if you're sworn to secrecy or how much you can tell us, but can you tell us a little bit about your character in season two now that you're being possessed by this new demon like how is that 
change your character's personality? Like, did you have to act different? Can you talk us through like your process about becoming this new character? Or are you pretty much the same? How, like what's happening with you in season two? Oh boy. <laughs> um, there are not many words that I, I mean, there are so many words that I could say about Eden, but she in as little of time as possible is having a lot of fun, a lot of fun, but also still keeping to her, her strengths of, of just like what her heart wants. And um, she's just having a lot of fun. And I enjoyed playing her second season so much. There's a lot of really great content to be seen. Mm. <laughs> a little mystery there. And uh, uh, Griffin, uh, going to you, um, what's it like for you to play these, I guess, you know, like Aaliyah, these multiple personalities, you know, you have to, you're Kinsey's boyfriend, you know, and then, but on top of that, we know as, you know, viewers that you're also Dodge. So yeah. I mean, again, with your character, I'm just curious, like, do you have little subtleties that you worked on on your own to kind of differentiate yourself? Or did you work on that with uh, uh, Meredith and Carlton just through the script? I'm just curious how, how that all worked out. Um, you know, honestly, uh, Meredith and Carlton and, and the whole writing team made my job very easy. Um, it's always it's always a lot of fun when you can walk on a set and the writing's so good that you can just play it naturally and, and have fun with it. And the writing kind of does the work for you. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, honestly, um, season season one, I got to play around a lot more with the whole, uh, no one knows I'm a demon, but I am evil and I, I'm going to like find some subtleties and some weird places so that the, you know, upon a rewatch or something or at the end of the first season, people could be like, oh, wow, you know, he was acting a little a little funny, um, a little weird. Mm -hmm. But I'd say season two, I, I, I really just kind of, um, I got to have fun, you know, um, it's, I've never played a character like this before. I've never played um, the bad guy, really. And um, I really got to just kind of, you know, figure that out um, throughout season two, throughout just having this experience of playing Gabe, of playing, you know, the bad guy and having fun and being evil, which was a huge challenge for me because I don't, <laughs> I'm like a hundred pounds. I don't think I'm a very threatening person. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was fun to figure that out. And then, um, you know, playing playing you know I, I love Connor I love Amelia I love Halea and so you know when I got to be with Connor and Amelia and I had to put on the the good you know good boy act that was you know really they made it really easy on me and when I was with Halea um we both got to tap into this like evil side which was um you know fun and and it, Griffin, fun. Griffin just you know was a fantastic bad guy I mean it's different than other Thank stuff you. that he had done I think and Definitely. we were really excited to see him as an actor to sort of embrace the, the this role and and I think he brought to it you know kind of a both sort of an authenticity but also this kind of really great larger than life quality and it's a fine line to walk where you know you're trying to sort of imbue this character with some you know color and some dynamism but also not get too over the top and I think that he just nailed it oh, that so is a huge compliment wow <laughs> Thank you. Well, I was wanting to follow up on that, uh, Carlton, or either, you know, um, uh, Halea or, or Griffin, if you have a, a story about this, is there any time during filming where you maybe, did you go forward a little too much? Like, I'm sure they gave you freedom to kind of express yourself. Like, did you go a little too, <laughs> a little too evil? And they had to kind of pull you back a little bit. Or was there any, any stories like that? <laughs> I have... I had bruises from just like the kind of craziness that we, not from Griffin being, you know, anything more than what was, you know, safe but just how far we pushed it in the way of really dedicating ourselves to that fun play of the evil um, and really going for it physically as well as mentally and emotionally of just like really going for it together. And, and I, I really loved working with Griffin because he's literally like one of the sweetest humans I've ever met, <laughs> but he plays evil so <laughs> well, which I think is, kind of, it's a, crazy contrast and I, I find a lot of times some of the people who play the craziest characters are some of the most chill people um but yeah we we really really went intense on a few scenes and anyone who watches season two will know exactly the ones I have pictures to show like some fun bruises that I <laughs> I have good memories attached to they're gone now but back then <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if this is a, a spoiler. I mean, I'll say it in the least spoiler way possible. I'm sure everyone knows that there's definitely action sequences in season two. 
Um, so as that's pretty much all I'll say in, in terms of spoilers, but yeah, just like, you know, build off of what Halia was saying, there were a lot of action sequences where I was like, damn, this is like, <laughs> I feel bad right now. <laughs> some yeah. kicks, some punches that might've gotten like a little close. And I was like, yeah. I guys, I'm scared. <laughs> it was really fun to play the dynamic between Griffin and I, um, because Gabe is just, I, I mean, he's not the nicest human or Echo. He's just, especially with Eden, because Eden's kind of like a little bit of a, like a little puppy to him at first, kind of just, you know, she's new, new demon, she's figuring it out. And he's kind of like, well, that you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And uh, it was, it was fun to play that dynamic together. Um, and there were many times where we were like, okay, let's just go for it. I'm like, it's okay. When the camera stops rolling, I know you're going to be like, you like, is everything all right? I'm like, yeah, go for it. We're acting, we're having fun. We're being crazy, murderous demon people. Like it's great. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun with them, yeah. Did, uh, you know, you have, uh, of course, uh, you know, Gabe Rodriguez on the call too. You just done some an incredible art, you know, for the, uh, you know, the comic book series. Were you, uh, when you did season one, or were you familiar with the book at all? Or did like, once you filmed it or while you're filming, like, oh, I should, I want to check this out or read it or, or did you want to like not look at it and just, you know, let the script inform you that way? So everyone started reading it, you know, they were familiarizing themselves with their characters. I know that like Connor and Amelia and, you know, pretty much everyone was. Um, so I tried oh, I to, <laughs> I tried to figure out Gabe, uh, um, a little bit, um, just like character wise or kind of what I, you know, I envisioned, envisioned him as, um, I guess being selfish. And then I ended up going back and reading the books and seeing, you know, where, you know, he could fit in this world or how he could fit. And, um, you know, IDW and Netflix were so kind. They sent me like all of the books, which was great. Oh, and awesome. I have like, I have them all on a shelf in my room. Well, both Gabe and Eden are characters that were created um, by the wonderful Meredith and Carlton and the crew that uh, sit in the writer's room. And I feel like we had a lot of opportunity to play with that. Um, as awesome as that it would be, Gabriel, draw us. Um, <laughs> as funny as it would be to be comic book characters, I think it just like it kind of took the pressure off of being that character in the comic books and allowed us to play and play and play and develop. And I mean, as Griffin said earlier, uh, the writer room did such an amazing job of creating these characters that we didn't really have to try too hard. And yeah. uh, oh, sorry, as a creator of the comic, I, I would add that looking at the entire creative process of the show from out, outside every time I've been there and then watching the show itself and knowing all, all these people involved in the project, I think one of the, the strengths of the show is that you can actually feel in the screen how comfortable everyone from the production, uh, filming crew, acting crew, and the writers, they do feel like they are enjoying this and everything feels natural from them. So in a way, everyone feels comfortable in this world and they are enjoying their part in them and they interact in a way that feels natural. And I think that's one of the greatest achievements Creatively, creatively speaking about the show, because having said that, they changed a lot of things from the comic book itself. And the, our, our League of Villains uh, right here is one of the best examples of it. In, in the comic, we have a single bad guy that was a very focused character. All the evil was concentrated around him. And here we're exploring it through new characters that uh, nevertheless feel like a natural part of this world. So I think that's fascinating because it's one of the ways in which you not only engage everyone making the show and the audience of the show, but also you can capture the curiosity of the watchers that are also familiar with the Latin mythology from the books and to be equally surprised and fascinated for them. I think that's really, I think it's really incredible. Uh, if you don't mind uh, following up, uh, Carlton or Meredith, I was just curious, like, could you, would you mind talking a little bit about uh, those changes in the story? and? Uh, creating these new characters for the story because I, I I agree with with Gabe I think it's uh, with Gabriel I think it's fascinating that I get I have these you know graphic novels sitting here this collection that I get to read but then when I watch this I not only get that's part of that story as well but also kind of a different story in a way which I think is really cool so I was just curious how do you guys work that out uh, in the scripts sure yeah I mean in the comic there's a actually a different character named Zach Wells 
that is uh, has sort of the is the teenager that's kind of um, found his way in in Kinsey's friend group that you don't realize is actually someone else. So we wanted to kind of take that idea and create a brand new character so that people from even the comic book readers would be surprised by that you know cliffhanger reveal at the end that actually Dodge all along was mm -hmm. was Gabe, and then we're just big fans of shows where the villain, you have sort of a different villain every season. Um, I think that sometimes it can get kind of tired if you're watching a show and season after season after season, that villain doesn't change. And so we love the idea of in season two, you know, really kind of turning, even though Dodge is still very much, you know, still around, uh, now Dodge is Gabe and Gabe has uh, his own, his or her own sort of personality and own mission and own dimension. And then adding Eden to that, just to have them be their own sort of like delicious, evil dynamic duo and have, and being able to also follow along with them um, throughout the season for the audience to have this like dramatic irony of the audience knows that Gabe is Dodge and every scene that he's in with Kinsey, you're just like, no. Um, for the audience's enjoyment of that for a portion of the season, I'm not going to say for how long, uh, is, is super fun. Um, and their dynamic together, I mean, they've talked a lot about how intense and scary and violent it can get, but it's also quite funny. They mm. have great comedy chops and there is something very funny about the fact that Eden is a brand new demon who's just like soaking up every part of what Gabriel and Joe call meat world. Um, and enjoying it and eating all the things and like loving all of it. And she's reckless. Um, she like, has no rules where Dodge Gabe has rules. So it's, in, it's the fun dynamic between the two of them. The Dodge is just over her um, because she is not obedient. She is not listening to anything that he's saying. So in addition to it being really intense and scary and between them, there's also moments where we get some levity out of it, uh, which are some of our favorite our favorite scenes. And I was wondering uh, before I uh, let all, all you go, I'd I'd love to know uh, again, Carlton or Meredith, just are we going to learn a little bit more about the supernatural history surrounding Key House? I've just always been fascinated by everything about Key House and just the like, why is it the way it is? What's up with the big door down there with all the blue light and the demon shooting out like, you know, like what, what's going on there? Are we going to learn a little more about that in season two? Yeah, we learned a lot more about the mythology in season two. And, um, you know, uh, Gabrielle and Joe invented this incredible world and the mythology is so rich. And we just felt like we'd be doing a disservice to the story if we didn't lay some of that out and also the history of how far back it goes. And so um, they've they they have a much deeper mythology even in the comic books, but we did get to some of that. And then we sort of fit that into the story that we're telling because the show is not the same as the comic book exactly. Mm -hmm. But we are very beholden to, uh, to Joe and Gabe for incredible um, history and legacy of mythology that we really drew on to tell our story. And um, uh, last question, uh, I gotta go to Gabriel. I'm just curious, I, I saw, I, I've seen on social media that you and Joe have a new lock and key series that's ongoing called Hell and Gone that's set in the Sandman universe, which is another show coming to a, a, a Netflix soon. Um, he, uh, Gabe, would that be a good place for people to start or should they go to the very beginning uh, with book one? Well, the thing is that the story that we're doing in Hell and Gone with Joe Hill is a, it's a story set in the past of the Locke family. It's with Chamberlain Locke and his family. It's a little arc that we sort of developed in parallel with the main lock and key story and mythology. Mm -hmm. And we started the first short story back in 2010. And we just finished with Helen Gone. It's going to be the seventh volume of the collection, but it's with an entire new cast, a new set of characters, but in the same key house and same mythology. So in a way, it's a, a friendlier place to come into the, the concepts of lock and key for new readers, I guess. And for us, it was a very exciting and, and very personally important project because uh, the, the Sandman comics back from the 90s was one of the main reasons why we felt love in comics storytelling, both Joe and myself. We were huge uh, fans of the original comic books from Vertigo Comics back then. 
So having had the chance to do a, a story of lock and key set in the Sandman universe that allow us in a way to pay our respect to the, all the creators and the stories that inspired us to do what we do and to be able to tell a very important point in the, in the story of the Locke family in this story was amazing. So I would say it's, a, it's, a, it's especially a, a great point to dive into what the Locke and Key mythology can be because it basically exploits everything that we have developed in the last, I don't know, 15 years developing this story and these characters and this universe. And it was a great experience where we're, we're very happy that uh, the second and final part of that story just came out and the, and the new collected book is going to be hitting shelves very soon, I hope. Oh, thanks for that. And thank you uh, everyone for, for joining me today. I really appreciate talking about Lock and Key Season 2, which everyone can watch uh, on Netflix on October 22nd.